Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our uh, our panel for uh, for the first half of the evening uh, on your on your programs. It is K3 uh, um, hashtag K3 if you want to talk about it on Twitter. So first. Um, uh, 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 for, furthest away from me, we have uh, Vicki Osterweil, uh, is a writer, editor, and agitator based in Philadelphia. Vicki is an editor of The New Inquiry and an author of In Defense of Looting, forthcoming from Verso. Uh, in the middle is uh, Maya Binion. Uh, she's a writer who lives in New York. She's on the editorial staff of The New, Query, New Inquiry and The Paris Review. And then uh, closest to me, finally, we have uh, Nima Shirazi, who's a writer and editor and co-founder and co-host of the popular media criticism podcast, Citations Needed. Uh, and so without further ado there, let's, uh, let's just jump right, right into it. So we're, the panel here is uh, nerding out, and so we're going to be nerding out about the political problems of nerding out. So we're, um, uh, 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 and w one thing that when we were putting together these panels, a little behind the scenes, behind the music video for a moment, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really kind of like tossing around the idea of like what's uh, historically important right now. It did, really did seem like there's something about the, the nerd in this current political moment that seemed really important and cut against a lot of important long-standing things about the American consciousness that's really anti-intellectual and yet the nerd who you know is seemingly into like deals with ideas is is sort of ascendant in this really powerful way so um, uh, I, I just want to go sort of straight down the, down the line with you guys and and, and ask um, uh, introduce sort of introduce your work by way of sort of defining the nerd. So like, where does like the nerd and your work sort of I I inter intersect, and uh, um, uh, and, and just like why sh should we pay attention to that sort of nerd right now? Like, why why is that important? So yeah, let's start with you. Uh, there we go. Um, I think, uh, well, first, uh, let me say thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about nerds and like dunk on nerds and say really horrible things about nerds at a conference called Theorizing the Web, <laughs> which is like the nerdiest thing I could possibly imagine being a part of. Um, so thank you all. It's great. It's perfect. Um, so, uh, you know, in preparation for this panel, I was thinking about sort of doing a... Um, like a well, actually, uh, and you know, push up my glasses. Um, you know, the nerd, uh, the word nerd didn't really come into vogue until the 1950s, and blah blah blah. But it's changed. Uh, but I think rather than doing that, because that's boring and sucks, um, the concept of the nerd, uh, especially as we've been talking about it, and um, that is most familiar to me, is that uh, that sort of emerged out of the 70s and then into the 80s, um, like the pop culture nerd. The, the nerd that um, while you know they're socially awkward and not hip and um, wear funny clothes and um, uh, talk with a, with a silly voice, um, that they are less of the kind of isolated outsider um, with no friends and rather play their specific nerdy roles in community and in collaboration with other nerds. And so um, rather than, yeah, being this kind of simply socially awkward outcast, um, there's kind of a communal nerddom that uh, I think was popularized uh, in film and TV uh, throughout the 80s and, and 90s um, simultaneously with uh, kind of the, the rise of computers and the rise of, of uh, a lot of the tech that we now take for granted. So, um, you know, there to, to, to me, there's um, kind of a, a clear through line that um, with, the, with the advent um, and availability of the personal computer in 1981 to 1984, you then see uh, movies showing nerds a lot and computer science nerds are kind of the quintessential nerd. Um, and then... But what we've seen is that the nerd, um, the nerd has 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 won by and large, uh, uh, and I'm sure you know the other panelists uh, have actually spoken about this and written about this far more eloquently than I than I ever could. But um, 
but I think what we're seeing now and, and kind of where I enter this as someone that does um, political analysis and uh, media criticism a lot is to see how this idea of the nerd, which um, has not only been ascendant, but I, I think has kind of taken control, especially when you look at Silicon Valley and, and how important uh, the machines in our hands are to us and our everyday lives, um, and who is now wielding uh, power, uh, not only in the form of wealth, but the in, uh, form of political influence, and uh, how that kind of becomes politicized and how that is used in a very political way uh, when you get into um, wonkiness and nerdiness around policies um, and you know where explainer sites are uh, popping up and big data sets and big data mining, uh, Cambridge Analytica, like all these things are very nerdy things that wield tremendous control over how we operate and the way that our politics operate. Um, and it kind of uh, gives a glimpse of who winds up being in control and that the nerds who, uh, I think in, in, in the best sense as kind of this, this, this otherized community has gained power and rather than um, rather than fucking up the system, has just served the system and has made themselves all powerful uh, without actually um, doing anything to 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 help out others who 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 may have been marginalized along the way. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm interested in, in thinking more about the like communities that convene around nerdum because in a lot of ways I think they're like imagined or rhetorical or gestural, but to speak in the most basic terms, I think I've been thinking about the nerd as someone who um, privileges facts over people. And when I say facts, I mean like beliefs that that are sort of manufactured to appear as fact. Um, and so I think in the case of the adolescent nerd, that leads to the sort of like b benign or seemingly benign social isolationisms that are in basically like every teen rom-com um, not being popular, not having friends, getting picked last for like pickup baseball or whatever. Do people do pickup baseball or is it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, something that I know Vicky has worked a lot on in her writing um, and that I'm interested in talking about on this panel are the ways in which um, those seemingly benign forms of social isolation have um, accumulated and led to an elision of uh, feeling alone and being oppressed. Um, I think I've also been thinking about nerddom, and this is something that we talked about sort of in preparation for the panel too, um, in relation to fandom. And I think for me, fandom has been a sort of helpful analog or corollary for thinking about the nerd. I think in its ideal form, um, fandom sort of like marks um, a, like deviant sexual alignment with an ideology or person or object. Um, and I mean deviant in the sense that if you're a fan, if you're someone's fan, you're sort of, um, you're irrationally giving them access to your privacy, even though um, they're a stranger. So if I say like, I'm a Rihanna fan, I'm saying I like her music, but I'm also saying that um, her lyrics speak like for me or to me, like if she's like, sex with Rihanna is amazing. I'm like, sex with Rihanna is amazing. Um, and so I think like fandom is sort of, is, is, is fantasy. Um, but whereas nerddom appropriates real people and experiences into um, a set of facts or systems that are unpeopled, fandom sort of like maintains um, bodies and desires at its core. Um, yeah. Well, thanks everybody again, and thank you too. Um, I think, like, I really like that definition about privileging facts over people. Um, and so, I think, like, what I'm, why I got interested, um, other than the fact that, like, I'm in nerdy subcultures, um, what I got interested in it was the role of the nerd, particularly. Actually, I started paying a lot of attention um, just before Gamergate. Anyone who was like a gamer in nerd communities like saw the alt right coming for years and like we were like sounding alarms and like no one paid attention and in fact gamergate was totally victorious and the people who were i don't know if you remember gamergate but there was like this sort of organized online harassment of queers um, people of color and women
queer movement, you know, student activism, the, uh, the peace movement, all this stuff that really shook the foundation. So as that collapses, the nerd appears, like, especially in Reaganite America, as like, the actual victim of oppression that like white people can relate to, you know, like white people in the suburbs can like watch Revenge of the Nerds and be like, yeah, like I also like like computers, like I probably deserve to be aggrieved and oppressed, and so they very actively like they very actively like appropriate what is um, you know black power feminism these these movements, and um, I think uh, this is nowhere more clear than in like the very beginning of nerddom, as um, games critic Rob Zachney talked about at one point, um, uh, is a, a fandom, an over, a devotion to Star Wars, literally the most popular, most successful movie of all time. That like when it came out, and like liking that like makes you an outcast. Like it's a pretty suspect program. Um, so like. <laughs> What's, what's actually going on for the nerd culturally is that they are appropriating this thing that is the most mass, the most popular, and they're saying, this is my identity, and because I identify with this interest, like my oppression is equivalent to other political oppressions, and it, it's a way of basically invisibilizing those, those as we'll, we'll get into that more, though. So yeah, so that, yeah. Uh, David. Absolutely rock solid foundation that we can go for. So you all touched on well, let's make a list, right? Consumerism uh, of both media, but also of like tangibles, like computers and, and stuff, right? So like, uh, I, I think I made a list of our, our previous conversation, 1984, Reagan gets reelected in a landslide. Uh, um, uh, 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 the, the Macintosh comes out. Revenge of the Nerds also comes out. What? Toxic Avengers also comes out, right? So the eighty four, like you really can't separate, like, like Vicky said, like Reaganite America from the nerd as it's like necessary core, like like, like the other side of the coin. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but w what maybe some people are still scratching their heads about is like, okay, so how can uh, the agree this like aggrieved status of of cishet white boys still connect to like colonial like a like a, a nation state colonial apparatus right like, like how the hell do those two things and like actually inform each other because it really does actually seem like they do like there's something about this aggrieved status by taking like something that is accessible to everyone and saying that is the sub this the part like how my subjugation starts uh, because I like I know exactly how many bullets are on Chewie's bandolier or whatever, right? You know, like that's that's where that comes from, right? Like wh how, wh why is that wor working right now to to undergird both fascism and a militant liberalism, right? Like, he's like the like what you were saying about the wonk is is also really tangential, really close to this, and like all of the, it, but then also like p meme magic and Pepe's are also all seem to be connected here. So there's like this, this terrible nexus of all of these things. How, what is it, which is some, uh, I, I like ask all three of you to just sort of like speak to the connective tissue of, all, of, of that mess of things. Yeah, I guess like um, you, you sort of put your finger on it, like nerd, nerddom is the first Columbusing, you know? They're sort of like arriving and they're saying like, we discovered this, this is our culture. You know, this like, you know, I mean, Maybe in some points in the 80s, some of that culture was a little subcultural, but now, like, the Marvel is the movies. Like, comic books, like, video games are bigger than movies. Like, nerd culture is the mainstream. It's the most mainstream. But it's this move of acting like, because there are social situations in which it's non-normative to be super committed to those things, sort of, then, like, that, that like, is that is an equivalent subject position to, so like that's colonial and th to the degree that it's like, it's like, you know, you, you sort of, um, uh, settler colonialism is about like sort of arriving somewhere, putting it, the people, the indigenous people down by force with genocide and then saying, oh, like the, ho oh, it's so horrible that these like indigenous people have disappeared. It's so sad what's happened. Oh, like we are so, we owe everything to them and their commu or their culture. You and know? also ap appropriating their, their culture at the same time, being like, yeah, like we invented hummus. <laughs> like, you, no, you didn't. Um, no, I, I think that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think that there's this, uh, 
th there's this great thing that kind of you, we've 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 all been talking about, which is which is that. Um, the nerd culture not really being fringe in its inception, and it's just the obsession with it that kind of uh, makes makes it more uh, exclusionary. And so, you know, I mean, seventy five percent of Led Zeppelin songs are about Lord of the Rings. Like this, this is this is not a nerdy thing in general. It's just how you how you actually interact with that, um, what it means to you, how it kind of symbolizes yourself and your interests and your identity, I think, becomes that kind of linchpin of, of what, what changes a fan to a nerd or what's the difference between a, a geek and a nerd, which I think there's been a lot of discussion about that, you know, let's say a geek is someone that uh, is kind of more aligned with that, with that obsessive fandom. They're really into the authenticity of a thing uh, surrounding that thing, knowing all the facts, um, and, and the, and the minutia and the trivia, um, but a nerd kind of, uh, practices the thing that they love. So, uh, you know, a, a, like a, you can have a music geek who like, you know, is obsessed with whatever Radiohead. Um, but then a music nerd is someone who like probably plays a lot of instruments like actually does that thing. Um, and I think you can kind of parse those those terms, but um, the, the nerd as kind of appropriator and then practitioner of, of these things is I think really, really important to understand and, and, and kind of then how the, how the internet, like how the web and the rise of the web and the kind of ubiquity of it um, has then flattened, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of those signifiers in certain ways, so that knowing how many bullets are on Chewie's bandolier, like you could you could Google it right now. Um, so it kind of it removes like the superiority of that intellect of that of that I did the research on this. I've seen that so many times that I know I know that you don't know that. That's how much I care about this thing. And so the internet kind of flattens all that. It makes everyone be able to just look up the minutia. Um, and so there need to be other ways for nerds to kind of coalesce around maybe the same things, maybe other things, and basically divide and conquer that way um, so that so that they wind up being, you know, just as aggrieved, just as victimized, even though everyone has the same information now. But their obsession about something can be the difference maker. Yeah, I think a, a good corollary to, like, the fascist nerd or the nerd that believes um, himself to be oppressed is like the liberal nerd. Um, and something that I became really interested in last year were the ways in which nerd logic was sort of like co-opting popular critique. Um, after Trump's inauguration, there were sort of like two running catalogs in media. One was like a catalog of all of the people that had been harmed by the material violence like enacted in Trump's name. And the other catalog was like a catalog of these of Trump's fuck ups, basically like words he had misspelled um, or that his administration had misspelled um, facts that were incorrect. Um, and that latter kind of catalog really existed without any kind of reference to the former. Um, and they, these were like posts that were on like Vice, Huffington Post, like all of these like liberal media outlets. And some of them were in jest, they were meant to be funny. Um, others were sort of shameful, but they all kind of called for um, the president to act presidential or to like adhere to, um, adhere to the logic of decorum, which is sort of like, it's like a, it's like a gotcha, a gotcha logic that I think um, nerds rely upon. Um, and I think, it, I mean, it, there was also like, as these like catalogs were proliferating, um, a proliferation of statements like accuracy matters, facts matter, words matter, um, which are in my mind, sort of like the grossest appropriation of the language of like black lives matter to ensure the efficiency of a state that like ensures that black lives, um, worsen, um, but yeah, so that's maybe like, and I know that, that you've thought about this in your work too, like um, how wonks sell, uh, I don't know. You can, you can talk about it better than I can. No, well, I, you know, I, th I think it's, um, it's, it's, been, it's been shown, the data shows, um, that uh, 
fact checks and like debunking articles and sites. Um, and I find them actually very important. I think you, you actually kind of do need to do that. But um, oftentimes, uh, fact checks work to reinforce the, uh, the false information and that people actually don't go to fact checks and uh, then um, have like a new lease on the truth. That is not actually what winds up happening. It winds up reinforcing uh, all of these all of these bad things. People then revert kind of like more into their silos and be like, you know, it's you know, if the if if the facts don't kind of um, comport with your worldview, you just either ignore them or you change the facts. And so, um, no, I think that 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 winds up being really critical in terms of this um, the kind of wonkification of politics now. And and I think like oh do you, no, go ahead. oh I think I think maybe one of the reasons that one of the reasons that Nazi nerds have basically so managed to jam up the liberal mind and make liberals panic is because liberals are used to disdaining the flyover states, the anti-intellectual, you know, country-fried, racist, you know, with a Confederate flag underwear, you know, and you know, and two teeth or whatever the fucking classist nonsense they believe is happening. We all the, when Republican voters are so rich, anyway, um, um, and. Uh, and I guess like so so the way that like the alt right like gets like you know you get people at the New York Times to call them so dapper is cuz the alt right doesn't they insist actually that they have the facts they mar they marshal all of this pseudoscience and all of this um conviction and they spend they spent all their time like they grew out of um, 4chan and out of these internet forums, really built in trolling um, people. And the best way to troll someone is to make them get into an argument with you that you have no stakes in. Because if you don't care about the argument, you can say anything. And the person who cares about what, what it means will just get more and more frustrated. So they are incredible rhetoricians of a certain kind, which is that they can argue infinitely and find facts and do all these sort of strategies to, to elongate an argument so that you can't win. And liberals, if someone's making an argument, then like there must be some, like, well, everyone agrees that facts are important, so we should hear them out, because like if, if they're wrong, then the facts will prove them wrong. And it's like, no, the whole thing is marshalling wrong facts in a way that sounds like you're, you're, you're right, <laughs> I guess. So yeah, so I think that that's like, that interaction between reactionary politics and a kind of nerdy um, fact-based truth is really has become really apparent, and both sides are totally inadequate to the moment. Obviously, well, one one thing that that this definitely reminds me of that ties a lot of this together is uh, Whitney Phillips' uh, wonderful book. This is why we can't have nice things: a, a history of trolling. Where, where uh, you know, spoiler alert for this book um, that you should get anyway is that you know, like uh, trolling is not antithetical to popular culture or mainstream media, it's actually its logical conclusion, uh, logical extreme conclusion, right? Which is that you, you just like, you, you push things forward so hard and you, that you, you, that you break them and you make them sort of a, like a, tra a, a farce of, of, of the original source content. Um, specifically because you cynically sort of don't actually care about the topic. You care about people noticing it and generating discussion around it. Although, you know, like, but the, the MSNBC editor calls it, you know, engagement or whatever, whereas the troll just calls it, you know, like something really terrible. I'm, I'm not going to reuse the words that they'll, that they'll use it for, right? But it, it, it's terrible. Yeah, right. So it was, I, I think that that's another way that the, that like these things scale extremely quickly, right? That you go from just like, arguing about about pop culture directly up to uh, justifying war with Iran or something right is that is that it just like turns into well, well I can marshal not only facts but a really engage in powerful meaning that that uh, that feels right and then 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 those those facts just sort of take on a life of their own specific because they fit so nicely into this em emergent co uh, political common sense. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why the New York Times uh, op-ed page is just hiring professional trolls, and and you know, same with you know, that's the reason Kevin Williamson got hired at the Atlantic. It's like, you know, oh, he's a really compelling writer. I may not disagree because he's racist and wants to you know kill all women, uh, but he's beautiful prose, um, and. <laughs> So, 
yeah, I, I think that kind of the, this this professional trolling, um, especially of in, in many ways liberal sensibilities, uh, let alone leftist, but um, you know this sort of it, it's really just going to wind up being a fight over facts, and that's this that's this ruse um, where. You know, and I think you see that on on Vox and on 538 uh, a lot, that it's really just, um, if you can get out the best facts, then all the problems go away, because it's really just a matter of plugging in the right equation, and therefore equity materializes, um, as opposed to actually seeking justice and, see, and, and actually uh, using, actually, David, you wrote uh, wonderfully about this, how, um, see what I did there? That's nice. Wow how, uh, you know, you can kind of um, marshal all these, all these facts and, 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 and talk about the history of oppression and of social justice movements, and you do this and you lay this out in a, in a wonderful kind of, uh, you know, interactive, um, you know, 40 maps that explain uh, why black lives matter. Um, and you do that and you publish it on Vox, and you can go all the way explaining how powerful movements arise. And then the end of it is which is why we need to like elect mainstream Democrats and get incremental change, and um, there's no reckoning with how justice actually happens um, because there's no interest in the in the by, by the people who are who are uh, leaning on this kind of evidence-based, fact-based uh, view of the world um, that uh, you know <laughs> like. They don't want things taken away from them for justice, which would be a good first step. Um, and so therefore, that's never really what they're arguing for. They're arguing for, this is how we got here, and this is how we stay here. Yeah, I remember when um, oops, when um, Trump issued the immigration ban and liberals were like, like, gotcha like none of the none of the countries that are listed on the ban have citizens that have killed like u.s citizens but obviously like the the like extension of that is that these sorts of bans like could be good if only the state wielded them accurately um yeah and and i think like like um to to that and to, to your point about social movement i think the alt-right has been really successfully historicized in a vacuum and by um, uh, fascists in socialist clothing like Angela Nagel as like coming from um, coming from a reaction to Tumblr politics, you know, or to identity politics. And that there's been this moment where everyone's been too nice and liberal and we care too much about trans people and that's why and like we care about their bathroom and like that's why there are nazis again and like that's what happened in the 40s too like obviously um, um and you know they talk about they talk about black lives matter like it started as a hashtag um but it was a hashtag but it really started as a movement with a quick trip on fire and like there's been these like we're in a period of incredibly heightened social movement, the highest, the most heightened social movement, most revolutionary period potentially in, in, the, in the West certainly for 40 years. And the, the nerd is a very, is, is being marshaled right now because the nerd is an ascendant cultural form. But, it's, but in Europe, the fascists are more traditional sort of street Nazis that, that, that we're used to seeing depictions of, but they're there too. And Modi's, Modi's movement in India isn't particular nerdy, nor is Duterte's. Duterte's is quite mass, you know, is very alpha male, you know. So there's this fascist moment happening everywhere, and it's structural, and it has to do with the collapse of the nation state and this crisis in capital. And the nerd is just the way that that's appearing in the US right now. And I think the reason that that's happening is precisely because, as you're saying, the nerd has become the central liberal form of truth. And so now it's being weaponized for the far right. And liberals are utterly, utterly pathetically useless in the, in the face of it. Yeah, it's like, it, well, it's like the, 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 you know, nerd is like the new, the new, like, Tony Montana, right? It's the new scar. It's like, first you get the money, right? And then you get the women, then you get the power, and so, or the other way around. But um, either way, um, either way, <laughs> at the top of this, of this pyramid is now the nerd, um, you know, uh, 
they're the they're the billionaires. They're the they're the ones uh, glad handing and taking selfies with uh, you know. Uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, you know, while he's beheading 50 people and uh, genociding uh, Yemen and creating, uh, you know, the the worst cholera epidemic in in, in history, and so um, and and yet, you know, pictures uh, of of him with Lloyd Blankfein and with Jeff Bezos and uh, Bill Gates, um, you know, there's there's no contradiction there. That it's that's exactly right. It's not. Oh my God! How can they do that? Don't they know what what he's doing? And it's like, of course they fucking know what he's doing. Like they're right that they're all doing that. They're all doing that. The reason you know uh, Saudi planes can be uh, refueled in midair is because like the U.S. is making that happen. And who's making it? Like you know. And so uh, you know, let's not let's not also think about the nerd as this tragically um, uh, sort of misunderstood and now mislabeled um, entity, you know? I mean, nerds created uh, the atom bomb. Like, that's, you know, like, Karl Rove was behind Bush. Uh, Kissinger was behind Nixon. Like, the nerds and the kind of technocratic class enable that more macho sort of, not, I don't know if Nixon's macho, but, uh, <laughs> But, but, uh, but that kind of idea of, um, you know, what, what, what enables, uh, the kind of frat boy power and it, well, the, the nerd foundation. So we have like about five more minutes before we're, we're going to turn to, no, before, before we then turn to, to audience questions. But so w one thing that I just want to, I want to tee up that we, we can spend the rest of the time talking about is that, so, um, uh, you, you mentioned Nima that, you, uh, that something has to undergird all of this uh, uh, colonial force, and it, and what I thought you were going, you were, then you said it's the United States that lets you refuel planes in midair. But what I thought you were going, how you're going to finish that sentence is you need engineers, right? And you need you need people who actually technically know how to make the like the world literally change the world in the image of their creations right uh, 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 citation virilio right but uh, uh, but the um but the thing that's interesting i think is that you know when you look at uh, you know, I, I i taught for quite a while and went to graduate school at an engineering college and there you know nerd right and and there um you know uh, there is like a, a especially aggrieved status of of boys as like very des deserving of heterosexual sex. It's everywhere, and um, and then this is sadly relevant right now, given what what happened in Toronto, right? And, and um, it, but but that is actually very directly connected to like the ability to carry out these big fascist projects because you need the Ubermensch, right? You need the power of technology to make. Uh, the the will of a few people known because lot m many people will refuse those orders and so if you can create drones and a lot of tech and 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 networks that that don't resist right you can actually do a lot of fascist things very very quickly and easily and you can and it and it requires a nerd that is angry at at people. Um, uh, at actually marginalized people, but then also when they are uh, attacked on their own, the merits of their work, they can say, "I'm just following orders," right? So, so that, like those are the moments where, like, they where you could actually, if they are actually aggrieved, they would have solidarity with other people, but they don't, and it's specifically because their agency is always curtailed to to that aggrieved status, right? Yeah, I think when you're a part of. Um an imagined community without um, sympathetic or material ties to other people, it's very easy to feel like your personal hurt is an injustice. And so in the case of the stuff in, in Toronto, the condition of wanting sex and not having it, um, I've, I've seen now circulate as like a problem of access and the resolution is supposed, is like assumed to be one of redistribution. Um, when and when you think of what is actually being redistributed, like it's it's fat, it is totally fascist and scary. 
Yeah. You can't answer it with sex work, right? Like you can't, like you, you can't, you can't stop being incel with sex work. Um, although that seems like it would, like, in like you are actually volunteering. I'm afraid, like you can find a sex, you know. And so that crackdown going on right now on sex workers on Backpage and all that is totally connected to the, to the, the aggrieved, co confusing. Like it seems contradictory, but it's the same impulse. I think. Right, and so then the reaction winds up killing a lot of people in an uh, immigrant community um, in Toronto, where, you know, which is, I think, majority uh, Asian and Iranian even. So, uh, I mean, you, yeah, you, you kind of see that, see that manifesting uh, in, in very vicious and, and uh, violent ways. Um, yeah. And five minutes. Excellent. So uh, uh, you, uh, uh, Jeremy's going to take, uh, take my microphone, run around, and, uh, and uh, take your questions. Okay. Thank you all very much for your uh, discussion tonight. Um, one of the things that you kind of started to talk about at the beginning, but kind of lost a little bit of the thread of, I felt, was the gendered and racialized power dynamics within nerddom and the ways in which that plays out. You, you do spend a lot of time talking about the ways in which the appropriation of oppressed uh, dynamics by you know, the, the dominant power structure to take on the, the aggrieved status um, has a certain power valence, but we can't allow ourselves to really forget about the flip side of that, which is those of us who do not align perfectly with the power dynamic structure, uh, who do find ourselves within, actually within ca like communities in which our interests are being appropriated, our interests are, our cultures are being made nerdily cool, uh, being made chic in that way. So I was wondering if you all could spend a little time discussing that a bit. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy. I think, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's really important. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with this because like I am in incredibly nerdy communities. Like I really like, I spend a lot of my time on video game websites and playing online games. I play like, I play Dota, which if any of you know about is like one of the most toxic online communities to like be a trans girl like on, in this game is like it's horrifying honestly um so yeah so it's it is very like it's it's a real so i think there's two there's two answers to that question and one of them is that it's also true that some straight white boys have horrible experiences of bullying because they're nerdy and it may be because they're fat or they're seen as effeminate but there th th there is real violence that comes out of this it's not a pure image um, and then also within those communities, like Gamergate, you know, Gamergate was this was was a horrible loss because there was actually in 2014 this incredible flourishing non-white queer gaming and game criticism community. It was awesome. It was really exciting. People were rising to the top of it. Like it was there was there was a lot happening. There was a lot of creativity, and it and it was it was smashed. It was organized. It was there was an organized smashing of that of that cultural production. And now all the insights from that have been, you know, appropriate as you say. So so it's not just the relation of the nerd to the non-nerd, but it's also they they pra nerds practiced on themselves before they became the alt right, before they started doing mass shootings, they were getting rid of Zoe Quinn and, you know, all all the all the interesting the, those people. And and that continues obviously. I mean, I mean, there are a lot I if you go on like left leaning like gaming sites, like everyone is trans. I don't know what it is. Like I don't know why we like it, but like there's like so much like gender. I think because you can experiment with gender. I first learned the first time I like before I even really knew what was going on. I found myself like customizing female avatars for hours and like saying I was a woman in chat rooms like about video games before I knew what the hell I was doing. So there's a lot of like in those spaces. There is a lot of like room for creativity and excitement. The culture itself isn't indict. You can't indict the culture itself. Nerds precisely find something that's interesting and then they claim mastery over it. They claim expertise over it and they push everyone else out. And that's the sort of that's the re reactionary nerdy move. 
But there are, I mean, most of my favorite writers and thinkers and some of my best friends are like definitely nerds, you know? I don't know. I am too. Anybody else? Raise them high. All right, hold on. We'll come down. We'll come back up. Uh, in 2018, do you see an evolution from... Uh, Baby boomers to Generation Z, uh, do you feel like older people are more locked into a self-conception of nerdiness that they have? Or is there uh, fluidity? And uh, in other words, how do you think the relationship of the nerd to their nerdiness, to their nerdiness changes between generations? So there, there was actually a panel uh, 24 hours ago, exactly, right here on this stage that talked about how generations are bullshit and how they're all just this this marketing construct, uh, which I think is is only partially true. Um, <laughs> but like I think the baby boomers are actually a generation. I think where we are now is maybe less so. But um, I think rather than boomers having a conception of of, of nerdiness, which would be like, I don't like Gary Cooper and Ball of Fire. Like that's not that nerdy. Like that's just really smart and also good looking. Um, but but rather Generation uh, X, I think, has a far more sort of pop culture um, conception of the nerd, and um, and hopefully that's breaking down uh, in that sort of stereotypical way, in the Revenge of the Nerds way. Um, in the in the war games way, but um, but I think that now it's 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 been altered, and that's you know I think a lot of what a lot of what we've been talking about how um, I sw I told myself I wasn't going to say his name, but Ben Shapiro um, is like this uber nerd, right? Like the 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 his popularity is based on him being a nerd and 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 in proffering these horrible destructive vicious ideas but with intellect and 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 with um you know smarts and so i think that there's just a new way of kind of uh understanding what a nerd is now um because the the generation x nerds of nerds of old are um are you know running the world. So there's a there's a different there's a different dynamic at play. Sweet. So I had a general question about the implications of other bodies within ner the nerd space as you guys have constructed or as you all have constructed it. So it seems to me uh, given the conversation that nerds have become this kind of problematic force that props up the kind of frat boy image. So my question is, are all members of the nerd community implicated in this? And the reason I ask this is we can think about alternative manifestations of the nerd, say within black culture, black hip hop culture, you know, I'm going to go back in the lab and create a sick beat, so on and so forth, right? The use of that kind of nerd imagery within hip hop culture to alternatively present what it is to be a nerd. So my question is, generally, um, are we ta painting with too broad of, the br of a brush when talking about the label nerd? Or is there possibilities for uh, nerds that come out of marginalized spaces to use that term in ways that does not align with the construct that you guys have created or you all have created at this point? Yeah, I mean, something that I was thinking about in preparation for this panel too was like the proliferation of like blurred as, as like, as a term and as like an associative identity. Um, but I think like the difference and and the reason why that, I mean, I know David had prepared a question too that was like, is the term or identity nerd like worth um, worth keeping at this point um, and. For me, I care less about the like terminology and something that um, feels very different to me about um, the communities that have convened around something like the blurred is that they're like real communities um, and they like, I don't know. You can go on go online and see people that are like engaging with each other and talking to each other. And so I think, yeah, your question is a great one. And we definitely have painted a very um, broad, uh, 
broad stroke, like in this conversation, or maybe it's been like myopic. Um, but yeah. 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 I think, I think like, yeah, the, 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 um, there's no such thing as like white culture. It doesn't exist. So like even nerdness is like stolen from black culture. Like, I think like, it's pretty clear that like, it's, it's this attempt to like, it's this attempt to be, um, to be like the reason that I described so much of the sort of appropriative sort of like position is precisely because I think there is no content to it actually. Like all it can do is like take something from other cultures that are actually in struggle and that are actually, um, uh, you know, oppressed. Um, and so I think like there's definitely space for people. I think, I think like if, if, if cool, if like, right on nerds had been better organized in 2014 and like we had like fought back uh, like if there had been more tamping down of like Gamergate like maybe the alt-right would have been way less powerful in 2016. I think it's definitely possible for those communities to like emerge and organize and like be relevant but I like I think I'm really talking about just the way that like I've been talking about with a very broad brush the way the nerd as it is envisioned as a straight white male has been used here. But lots of people, myself included, fall outside that definition, but are nerdy. And I think it's it's not it's not about evacuating the territory. It's not about you know saying oh like nerds is fascist forever and like you can't be nerdy like that's it. But it's a way of um, it's just pointing out a way that 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 kind of stuff is organizing itself now. I think is, is what's important to me. And now live from Twitter. Okay, so Twitter user Clotilde, uh, handle at underscore Sinar, C-Y-N-A-R, asks, can we talk about gender and nerddom, maybe a bifurcation where women get to be fans, but the men get to be the experts and fascists? <laughs> so like life, like the way the world operates? Uh, no, I think, I think that's great. I think... Um, I, I don't think I have a, a revelatory uh, reaction to that. I think that that is um, that that's a really good question, and I think that that I, I think that 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 setup that that dynamic is um, is is often true. I think uh, just just briefly the kind of gender issues uh, within nerddom um, are are seen. Uh, much, much like they are uh, in 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 broader society, there's a marginalization, there's an objectification um, of even like the girl nerd. And so, um, I mean, Vicky, in 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 your piece, I think you you kind of dig into that a little more as well. Uh, how how nerds kind of use that objectified uh, female uh, figure. And also, nerddom is in itself kind of this, this. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I guess yeah. Like I think like in some ways, like for my thinking, in my thinking, like fandom. The thing that's sort of positive about fandom is quite femme. Like it's about desiring what Maya was saying. Basically, there's this sort of. You know, you think of like Beatlemania and of all these like 16 year old girls like screaming at the top of their lungs, like terrifying everyone in America or whatever, um, which is like pretty cool. Um, and like, I think like, so, so in a certain way, like nerddom is a very masculine response to interest. And I think like, it is important that like nerddom, like largely, I don't know what, well, else to say, except it, it largely manifests as gender aggrievement, incel, you know, that it, that it, it Nerds tend to say race isn't an issue, and then they tend to be organized misogynists. So they tend to kind of want to be post-racial, I mean, unless they're like literal Nazis. They tend to sort of be like, like, like they pretend that race isn't a problem, but that gender, they're the actual oppressed ones. So gender is the axis on which I think reactionary, bad nerddom that we've been talking about largely um, organizes itself. Hi, thank you for this panel. I have a question which is inspired by, the, by a discussion I had in the break around uh, nerddom and depoliticizing political questions. So thinking about the Mark Zuckerberg hearing, um, especially the first one came across as, even though he couldn't answer a lot of technical questions, here's this nerd expert and there are ignorant politicians. Do we really want these politicians to regulate if they don't even understand the internet? 
Yet when you're a policy nerd, so like lots of areas like food policy, foreign policy, nuclear power plant regulation, all of these are nerdy, geeky topics. Why do you think does tech get away with saying we're the nerds, trust us? Well, in fact, actually, we they've been they they they, they have been making mistakes, etc. Well, they're really rich and powerful, so <laughs> they get to say. But no, I, I mean, I guess like I think my you were you were talking about this. Or I don't know if you want to get into it, but I think you should answer. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. No, but I guess I think like I think like um, I think I think like the reason that like tech tech stuff like gets away with with that kind of nerd is be precisely because it's so well in America they like they, we don't trust politicians in America very much. It's a it's a it is one of the only truly good American traditions is to hate politicians. Um, uh, and I think like there's that combined with like a kind of um, yeah, a sense that like these things are like we love our phone and our internet and everything, but uh, but then um, so we sort of we have trusted them to manage our social media accounts. So like we like we wouldn't trust you know the government the the Senate to do it. So I think we've already done that level of trust, and so it's easy to then in the face of Mark Zuckerberg himself just be like, oh well, he's better he's better than them at least. I mean you know. Hi. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe to tie in with a couple prior questions here. Uh, first, you know, there's, uh, I'm not sure your name uh, fully to my left, uh, uh, talked about how there are cases where, you know, uh, uh, being, finding nerddom at some point comes out of, you know, actual uh, uh, pain and personal experiences, and that's a refuge to a certain extent. Um, and, uh, in the you know mid to late 80s, there was definitely a uh, sort of confluence of things where uh, computers and technology were this uh, new medium to uh, be creative, to find uh, effective uh, 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 media to work with and people to talk to. And all of that was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, pushed away by a certain degree of like toxic masculinity, where if if you can apply technology towards money or uh, obtaining power, then that is you know very much encouraged. Whereas if you're doing it to be creative or you know effective, uh, that is certainly discouraged, and that has a crazy dynamic, especially with uh, uh, another uh, person who had a question about you know women nerds how at that same point in time, women interacting with computers and technology were, were strongly discouraged across the board, just as technology became a, 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 a mode of gaining power and, you know, potentially, uh, uh, you know, influence and, and, and money and things like that. So I guess that's more of a comment than a question. I don't know. I'll respond to your comment. Uh, no, I think that... Um, I, I think that that's that that's exactly right, and and um, and that there's there's an aspect to not 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 completely, but an aspect to nerdiness and and also facility with with technology uh, that I think um, is often the domain of the already privileged. I mean, to be able to delve that deeply into something, to have the time and the resources to uh, not only in the in the earlier days of technology when everything was even more expensive than it is now, it, relatively, um, that you know to kind of be an obsessive fan of things takes time. Again, takes uh, the 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 privilege of of um, having a lot of things in in your life or your society or your community already taken care of, where 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 you're not having to fight bigger battles. Uh, for yourself, but but can rather sort of delve into something. I think there are also ways where that's contradicted, where a way to delve into something is a way to fight that battle. But um, but I think that uh, once you sort of recognize that um, technology and especially the internet um, really did enable and facilitate a different kind of 
uh, community building and collaboration and, and ending the isolation of, of what it may have been either honestly felt to be or perceived to be a, a, a nerd and an outcast, um, that that then built up its, its own uh, toxic communities, not always, but that um, again, once the, once the nerd ascended to the top of the power pyramid, um, through that uh, medium, through through technology, uh, gaining wealth, gaining power and influence. Um, what you know? What actually? Uh, Vicky talks about this uh, very very wonderfully in 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 her essay about about nerds. And maybe I can hand it off. And in, in terms of the the uh, the climax of the film, Revenge of the Nerd, kind of speaks to this. I think very um, directly how. Um, once, once the nerds win, um, it, it, it's all about humiliating those who, who humiliated them. It, it's not about a new way of, of, of operating in the world. It's, it's about getting back at who oppressed you. And now you're just the oppressors like that, like, and being fine with that. Uh, oh yeah, I, I guess. That sums it up well. I guess I, I would just say that, like, I think, like, what your question made me think of is the fact that the word computer used to mean a woman who did math, um, and computers themselves, and as a masculine domain, is an act of appropriation by men of of women's work. Probably a good segue from my question. Can you talk about the way that nerds compete with each other? particularly within their own communities for the sort of status of kind of supreme nerd. And I would be very interested in thinking about that within the realm of the academy. <laughs> so as the one from the academy, uh, yeah. They, um, uh, so, so one thing, you know, right. It, it's revenge of the nerds, not like Fierian, Ju like justice of the nerds, right? You know, like there's no like, you know, like freeing the 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 oppressor and the oppressed at the same time the version, right? And and that is doubly true in the academy, where um uh it, instead of in, instead of finding out how to make the what people inside the academy would think is like the the production like the factory of new and radical ideas, it is in fact it just made this like elaborate route. Rube Goldberg apparatus to like test out how many people can listen to each other about your your one new idea, right? And 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 that is sort of like this like fantastic system of one us of one upsmanship, which sounds like a very nerdy way of competing, right? It's just like let's throw data at it to make sure like I can from like three decimal points know how much better I am than you. Uh, right. Uh, so I, 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 th I think that's a pretty quick answer to your question. And uh, I think we're, I think we're at time, but uh, is there anyone else that wants to jump in real fast? No. Okay. Then I think that's, that's it. And since I have the microphone, this is very convenient. Uh, 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 uh thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, round of applause. Uh, yeah. V uh, Vicky Maya Nima, thank you so much. So we're, we're uh, we have a we have a couple minutes to uh, to take uh, take a, a quick break. What is it? Seven thirty. We start again, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, butts and seats at seven thirty for our our, our final uh, uh, keynote panel K four. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>